Happy World Puppetry Day 2021. It's been one year since Talking Sock was first released. So to celebrate, we're giving you some extra content from one of our very first guests. It's story time with Richard Bradshaw. Richard has had an amazing life. In this story, you'll hear about his fabulous years full of interesting people while he lived in the UK. Thanks for a wonderful year and thanks for listening to Talking Sock. So, Richard, in the early days, you travelled to England and you ended up sharing an apartment building with some pretty significant Australian contemporaries. Uh, What did you find in England or, moreover, who did you find in England? Well, I'm going to give you some background to this story because I've already mentioned uh, seeing Jan Bussell and Anne Hogarth perform in Sydney in uh, 1952 when I was beginning with puppets. And I, in fact, I'd borrowed Jan's book on the puppet theatre even before that. I would have thought of it in 1951 from the library. Um, and I met them for the first time in Leningrad at a puppet festival. And after that festival, we went to Moscow for a mini festival. And then Edith and I travelled back to London mainly by train, from Moscow to Ostend by train. And Jan and Anne were on that same train. There was two nights on the train. And on the way, Jan said, would you like to work with us in the summer holidays? Uh, And they did shows in in parks with a caravan theatre in London. And so in the first three weeks, we went to 45 parks. That's three parks a day. Goodness. uh, Doing this puppet show. That was a great way to get to know London. Yes. At the end, I'd been staying near where they lived on the banks of the Thames at Egham. But I had to find somewhere to stay in London. I was looking around various places and I ran into someone that I had taught with, uh, Sandy Newman. And Sandy said, my brother is in a flat in Kensington uh, where there's someone leaving, there's going to be a vacancy. So perhaps you could fill the vacancy. Well, Sandy's brother was Mike Newman, who happens, as it would seem unlikely to be the father of Frank Newman who ran (laughs) Terrapin Puppet Theatre for a while, but there was no connection between me and that. Um, So I went to this marvellous building at 18 Melbury Road, Kensington, which had been the home of the pre-Raphaelite artist uh, Holman Hunt. And uh, so it had a blue plaque. It, It now has another plaque because the King of the Zulus had some years earlier lived in this building, we had the the bottom uh, floor of this apartment, um, and uh, it was the landlady was Thelma Hammond, who had ladies' orchestras, and she used to practice the saxophone in in the basement flat underneath us, <laughs> wow. and there was a flat of Australian girls up the top. Now, I took the place of Clive James because Clive was going up to uh, Cambridge and uh, so he would come down and stay with us from time to time. So he even came to the annual general meeting of the Educational Puppetry Association at the beginning of the following year, in in February 1965, uh, because I was doing a show uh, there, a shadow show, and he liked it. He said, you should bring this up to Footlights. It never happened. <laughs> wow. Anyway, um, the other pe- people in the flat at the time were Ken Haller, who, with John Bell, started the Nimrod Street Theatre, and Bruce Beresford, the, who was about to go off to Nigeria to work with the Nigerian Film Board. So various other people came, including someone called David Bradshaw from Melbourne, who was no relation at all, but he was for a while the director of the Art Gallery and Museum in Newcastle. Um, so it was a wonderful flat. Um, people like Jermaine Greer visited, uh, Les Murray. Uh, it, it was great for me because I had done science and was a year ahead of most of these people at university, so I hadn't been quite in that group, and it was a, a great introduction. When John Bell first arrived in England, he uh, he stayed with us uh, before he went down to, to Bristol. Um, and later, when I did a show for the Nimrod Street Theatre in their second season, I needed someone to pull the rope for the elephant, and John used to come in every night <laughs> to pull the elephant's rope. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a euphemism, folks. Um. <laughs> now, <laughs> next door, there was a flat 
uh, it was a studio flat, was part of the same building, and that was occupied by Brett Whiteley, Brett and Wendy Whiteley. No. And so I remember trying to get to sleep at night listening to, Hey, Mr. Tambourine, as Brett was painting to Bob <laughs> <laughs> he was doing the zoo series at the time, so giraffes and various things. He'd, he'd finished the Christie series. Uh, and there was one afternoon when Clive had a job working for Bertram Mill's Circus at Olympia. It, it, it says that he was cleaning out the tiger's cage. I, I thought it was the lions, but it must be the tiger's cage. <laughs> um, where we went off, I can remember walking along the street, Brett and a couple of the others, to go and see the circus just so that we could catch Clive in his circus uniform as the cleaner out of the big cat's cage. Wow. So uh, those were great memories. I remember Charles Blackman chasing Brett Whiteley around our flat with false teeth made out of orange peel. It must have been <laughs> absolute madness having all those creatives in that space. And, oh, my God, talk about a name drop, but also talk about just rubbing shoulders with, you know, the up and coming and the best and the best in Sydney and Australian it was, arts. It was great. We, a, a group of us uh, formed an Australian company and put on a, a review called Guarding the Change, which is, some of the sketches were written by Clive. It wasn't a great success at all. And part of the reason, we did it at the... Uh, New Lyric at Hammersmith uh, had a three-week season because the theatre had been dark and they were quite happy for someone to use it. Uh, but on the opening night, we got message from the Lord Chamberlain who had to censure every or censor every script. Uh, of course. He, uh, he said, oh, you can't do these two sketches. So one was about Scott and the Antarctic aiming to be there by killing off everyone so that he would be the only person to get to the South Pole, not the... Oh, right, <laughs> wow. And, a little uh, morbid. <laughs> and the other was a speech given by Britannia that Clive had written. It's a very funny speech, and uh, that wasn't allowed. And then the man from Equity came in just as the curtain was about to go up and said, I have here permission to stop this show going on. We already had an audience in. And as he said that, there was a clap of thunder. And I can remember Mike saying, you seem to have the power with you. Anyway, <laughs> anyway that was resolved. We were able to, to get by with Equity. We had a three-week season, but because of the publicity that came as a result of this, these band sketches... The uh, we did it on BBC TV, so <laughs> any the whole world could have seen it, or any all of England, and uh, and also the script was printed in the Daily Mail, word for word. So word for hundreds word. of people got that, that uh, and only a few ever saw it in the theatre. Crikey. Would, would have seen it in the theatre. So um, it shows that the Lord Chamberlain's office was a rather stupid office. And in fact, it only lasted for a couple more years. What a story. And I'm sorry, but I have to ask you, in the very early part of that story, you mentioned an association of teachers in puppetry? Or? No, 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 they were not puppeteers. They, they were actors. Uh, Monica Maughan, who's a professional actress here, uh, she, she was one of them. Uh, what was the title of the association again? No, it, we called it Cananda, but it was uh, the review. It was just formed for that one show, Guarding the Change. Before that, you mentioned a different association that you... Oh, the Educational Puppetry Association. Yes, the Educational Puppetry Association. Yes. That sounds like the two things I love most in the world coming together. Tell me more about that. Well, there were two puppet associations in England at the time. There was the Puppetry, uh, Puppet and Model, Model Theatre Guild, British Puppet and Model Theatre Guild, and there was also the Educational Puppetry Association, which was uh, mainly teachers, although the person that seemed to lead it was Panto, uh, Panto, Puck, Panto Philpot. Um, and so the, my, when I arrived in England at Southampton, Edith made sure that that night <laughs> we went along to the Educational Puppetry Association, and that's where I met some of the people like, Ronnie LeDrew answered the door. Uh, John Blundell, who made the the chauffeur for Thunderbirds, was there. Oh, Thunderbirds! Uh, and so um, it was a wonderful introduction to puppeteers there. Um, and uh, so it just happened that I was doing that show at their annual general meeting, and that's what the puppeteers the 
other people in the flat had nothing else better to do, so they came along. We must find out if it still exists. Do you think it still exists, this association? I don't think it does. It did. It brought out a book. I I have a copy of it behind me here. Um, it It was for teachers, and I think in the same way that the... Puppetry Guild here faded out because the number of teachers uh, dropped. Uh, I think that's probably the same for the EPA. I don't think it exists. I mean, in fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Tragic. It was in Southampton Place, not far from Hoban Station. You I have a wicked know. memory. You know that, right? Incredible yeah. memory. <laughs> He's got <laughs> dates down. He's got everything. He's just I, got it. It's just that I can't remember my name. <laughs> Actually, I have to tell you a story about David Bradshaw that stayed with us. He's died since. But my agent in Melbourne was at a dinner party and he was there. And when he found out that she promoted shows for schools, he said, I flattered in London with a puppeteer, but I can't remember his name. (laughs) Devil. (laughs) Would have been such good work. Since it was Bradshaw, I think that's a bit... (laughs) <laughs> Fair. We'll leave it there. Stay tuned. We'll be back soon with season two of Talking Sock. <laughs>